Hello everyone and welcome to our 29th devlog. So I have a lot to talk about today since two weeks is a pretty long time and we've added a lot of features. So that being said, I'm now going to start doing weekly devlogs, so the next one is going to be next week. Alright, so let's get on with it. Alright, so first off, there are quite a few things that we implemented into the game in the past two weeks. So as you can see, there are now tiles, and they're actually being loaded onto the map, and there's player textures that have changed too, it's different from last time. And actually the sprite sheet for the tiles has a lot more tiles than this, I'll show it on the screen right now. And I'm not going to add them just yet, I'm going to wait till I have a decent tile loader. I'll probably add that in in a couple of weeks. So having these tiles shown like this shows that I actually have maps now. And they have tile data to show where the different tiles go and everything. And that's actually stored on the server. And it actually gets transferred over to the client through the network. So everything works uh, kind of like what it used to, except now I don't have file loading yet. Uh, but I'm going to add that in a couple weeks. So the next big thing I added are some control mechanics, so now you can sprint like you were able to back in the old version of Archipelo. And if you double tap the sprint button, you can roll, just like I showed in the past couple devlogs. There's some smoothing out that I need to do on the programming side. There's a weird flickering that happens every few seconds. It's definitely something with the game camera that I can fix, but uh, that'll be soon. I'm going to sort out all those little bugs in a little while. I just want to start adding some actual nice features to show you guys and to make the game more interesting. Another control mechanic I added was direction locking. So on the PC version of the game, if you hold down the spacebar, your direction is going to be locked. So you can move around in any direction that you want, but your actual, the, where your player is facing is going to be at the same spot as when you started holding on spacebar. So this is good if you're running away from enemies and you still want to shoot back at them, but you don't want to be facing the other way when you're running away. You can do this. Uh, so for Android and iOS, I'm probably going to implement this with some sort of toggle switch. Like I said, for a PC version, it's going to be the spacebar. I can't really think of a good way to do it for Android and iOS. We'll probably figure out something better then. And also for on controllers, you'll be holding down the trigger to do the direction locking. So when I added direction locking, I actually found a couple of errors. So on older, cheaper keyboards, you can't hold down the spacebar and the up arrow key and the left arrow key at the same time. So you, you can still lock your direction, but when you're locking your direction, you can't move up left, which is kind of weird. So I changed the controls so that the default key binding is WASD, and the player can change it back into the arrow keys if they want later on. I'm not too sure what the roll and attack buttons are going to be with WASD though. We might use the mouse, or we might also use um, the arrow keys. I also added some new camera mechanics, and that's probably why there's that weird flickering thing. So now you can easily lock onto other entities. So just say a player wants to lock onto an enemy so that they can shoot at them. The camera can actually move towards it and then it'll lock on onto the entity instead of the player. But we're not too sure how we're going to use that just yet, but it might be useful for some things. I also added the UI layer so that we can start adding some more UI stuff, so like health bars and things like that. And to demonstrate the UI layer, I added an FPS counter at the top. So right now you can see the FPS is amazing. I'm running on a relatively older computer and I'm still getting around 2000 FPS. When you add more clients, however, it starts to lag a bit more. That's probably because running more clients on the same computer, it has to divide the FPS between the different clients. But it might also have a little bit to do with how many entities are actually in the game world and how many have to be processed. So I'm definitely going to do some optimization once I'm done adding more mechanics to the game. I already have quite a few ideas for that. So from now on, I'm going to start adding a goal section to the devlog. It's a good way to keep me motivated and also gives you guys a preview of what's going to happen next week. So for next week, I plan on adding client-side prediction and correction. So and I'm going to explain a little bit how that works. So the logic in what I'm going to explain right now might not be completely sound. I'm going to work on it this week and try to make it perfect. But I'm going to re-explain everything in the tutorial series since it's going to be a multiplayer game. So some of you may have noticed that there is a problem with the diagram I showed you last week. And not only with the logic behind it, but also you can see it visually. You can see there's a big gap between the client time when they send the input that they make and when they receive it and display it back. So I've actually found that that delay can be up to 2 seconds on a really bad internet connection. And 2 seconds is a lot for input response. So that's what client-side prediction does. It basically just acts on the input right away, and then the correction part is where the client sends 
the player's position to the server and the server sends back whether that position is good or not and if it matches up with the server's position. So there are many advantages of doing it this way. So one, there's less lag for input. Of course over LAN you don't have to do this because there's not much internet lag. But if you're playing a game over the internet you kind of have to. But there's one big downside of it and is that cheating can actually happen so people can actually do speed hacks with this. So the reason this is possible is because when the client sends their position to the server, it might not match up perfectly. So I need to have some sort of room for error. But this room for error can actually be used as an advantage for players who want to add hacking onto their client. So they can actually move slightly faster. So I don't know how much room for error I'm going to add. It's probably going to have to do with the ping and things like that. But we'll see. I'm going to try my best to make sure it's at least hackable as possible. But that's not even the complicated part. The most complicated part is that there's such a delay on the client screen compared to the server logic that I actually have to account for it on the server. So just say the client is running 500 milliseconds behind the server. When they go to hit an enemy, they're actually hitting where the enemy used to be 500 milliseconds ago according to the server. So what I need to do is I need to actually store the state of where every entity is for at least two seconds behind on the server so that when the client tries to hit an enemy, it can go check back depending on the player's ping to see if they would hit if they would have hit the enemy back 500 milliseconds ago. So it starts to get a little bit crazy with this networking logic. I'm definitely going to try my best to do it and I think it'll be pretty cool to talk about in the tutorial. It's going to be a lot of fun to do, I think. Also, I'm going to put the articles I put in the last devlog back in the description. Because with these new changes I'm going to do to the networking, they're actually even more relevant than they were from the last one. So definitely check those things out if you want to get more information on this. Well, this ends off our 29th devlog. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like. And if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. It helps a lot. And if you're wondering about the tutorial series, I've talked about it a couple times in the video. And I've decided that it's actually going to be a series, not just a couple of random videos. So I'm going to start making a game from scratch using libgdx. I'm not too sure what type of game it's going to be. If you have any ideas, please suggest them in the comments below. I'll definitely check those out. And I'm going to start the tutorial series not this Tuesday, but the one after. So thank you so much for watching, and see you guys in the next devlog, which will be next Sunday. Goodbye.